Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Last week's election took place in the Chancellor's home state, but it was a debacle for her party and a triumph for the right-wing populist alternative for Germany. And many Germans are blaming the Chancellor. Merkel's Christian Democrats came in third in the local election, beaten for the first time by the right-wing AFD. They managed to win more than 20% of the vote, mostly by bashing Merkel's refugee policies. But the Chancellor still stands by the famous words she uttered a year ago as refugees poured into Germany, we can do this. Election humiliation. How isolated is Merkel? That's our topic today on Quadriga. It's a pleasure to welcome our guests. Ulrike Herrmann is a business editor at the Berlin Daily Tatz, and she says the AFD has peaked. The greatest danger for Angela Merkel is her own party. Mata Lehming is the opinion editor at Der Tagesspiegel newspaper. He thinks Merkel is going to have to deal with people's concerns about her refugee policy. Otherwise, the upcoming federal election will be a disaster for her party. And finally, a pleasure to have Janusz Decker with us. He reported on the Mecklenburg election for Politico. He believes Merkel could have been seen, could have seen it coming. For months, her critics have waited for an opportunity like last weekend's state election to undermine her position. So German media are mostly rather staid, but they've been using positively Wagnerian rhetoric uh, in a connection with this election result. Uh, Kanzler, Kanzler Demmerung, for example, the beginning of the end for the gods and for the chancellor, according to some. Malte Leming, how serious is the result, really? Is this truly some kind of a watershed? It is serious. I don't know if it's a watershed or things like this, but it is a serious result. A new party, a right-wing, a right populist party from the start gets more than 20% and beats the party of the, of the governing chancellor and, and puts her to second place. I mean, this is serious. It is just Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, I'd say just because it's one of 16 lenders in Germany with, the, with not so many inhabitants in it, so it, it's more or less a symbol. But it's a symbol because every party is, was losing there. Who, the SPD, the Social Democrats, the Green Party, as well as the Linke, the left-wing party. Everyone was losing and, and, and gaining was, there was the AFD. So it is, and Merkel is seen by most people as the symbolic figure of the refugee policy if she likes it or not. I mean, she took credit for it and she was praised for it by the UN Secretary General, by the President of the United States, by various magazines all over the world. So she is seen as the symbol figure of this kind of policy. It's a little bit unfair because she's governing in a grand coalition, but that's how it is. We want to come back uh, to whether it's fair or not. Ulrike Herrmann, a watershed. You say the AFD has peaked. Uh, they're looking pretty strong at the moment. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. They got 20%, so that's a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, now the refugee uh, topic is at its peak, and it's the only topic this party has. Uh, the, uh, this right-wing party doesn't have any program. It is only a party saying what they do not want, and mainly they do not want to have any refugees. Now, if there aren't any more refugees coming, and if those that we have now are being integrated, and if uh, everyone stops talking about refugees because other topics come up as being more important, then I just can't see how the AFD is is supposed to have more than 20%. I, I think that's the most they ever get. And it, it's especially important to see that East Germany, or former East Germany, votes very differently from the West. In East Germany, they have usually 20 to 24%. But in the West, they usually only have 12 to 15% and not more. For example, now there will be an election upcoming in Berlin. And there they have a survey saying that, it's, well, that they will have just 12%. Janusz Delka, uh, as mentioned, this is an eastern state, a part of the former communist uh, part of East Germany. Um, it's also very rural, very sparsely populated. It's also Angela Merkel's home state. You were there. How representative is this state, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, for the rest of the country? Well, I mean, I would say it is representative just for the fact because... This might have been a state election, but the campaign was not about state issues. The campaign, the campaign right. was about federal issues, national issues. It was mainly, my two colleagues have already said that, about refugees. Those are questions that are essentially being decided in Berlin, not in the state capital of Schwerin. And still mm -hmm. the whole campaign was about those national issues. So I think, you know, it is, even though it's, you know, in terms of like its size or its population, it is a small state. I think it was a very important election. 
Before we go on, let us perhaps take a closer look at the AFD or Alternative for Germany. Here's a short film. The AFD's negative election campaign drew lots of voters. They made it very clear what they didn't like. They spoke out against foreigners, who make up only 2.4% of mecklenburg vorpommerns population. The AFD did best in tourist towns. Anti-Muslim sentiment is strong. People are concerned about burqas and burkinis, even though there are almost no Muslims in Mecklenburg. Last year, the state took in only 2% of all the refugees that came to Germany. Anti-EU sentiments are also running high, even though Mecklenburg benefits from EU funding programs. A lot of the AFD's support comes from protest voters. What's more, 35% of their votes came from those who'd never cast a ballot before. But will the AFD be able to keep those voters over the long term? So let's add a couple more paradoxes to the picture. A new study shows that AFD supporters are on average at least as well educated and economically well situated as the supporters of the big parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, and the governing coalition in mecklenburg vorpommern which is comprised of those two big parties, the same big parties that are in a grand coalition here in Berlin, actually had made significant strides, pushing back unemployment, uh, consolidating the state's budget. So, Malte Leming, clearly this isn't about economics. What is it about? No, it was not about economics. As, as Richard has said, it was just about the refugee topic. I mean, this was the main topic ahead. And, I, and I'm afraid that, that, that Merkel didn't do the best job she could have done in, in, in explaining, not just explaining her policy, but taking away the fears that are coming with this. Many, many Germans think, okay, we wanted to help. There was a special situation a year ago in September when all the refugees in, in Hungary needed help and they had to come to Germany. But how many will come? And, and will that be repeated again? And, and things like this. And Merkel just refuses to answer these questions. And I think this is a big mistake because she she doesn't take away all the fears that are coming with this question. Therefore, it is still a topic. But Janusz Stelka, as I said, you were there, you talked to the people who wound up voting AFD. Uh, as we heard in our report, there aren't many foreigners in Mecklenburg for Pommern. Where is this fear coming from? What's driving it amongst people who, as I said, many of whom are well situated economically and well educated? Well, you know, when I was there, I had this one moment that I found striking. And this was actually during an event when Merkel herself went up to the state to meet with farmers. And farmers are traditionally considered like staunch supporters of her Christian Democrats. I mean, they're, they're really sort of like, you know, home territory for her. So she came there. She was well prepared. She's always very good in these sort of things. Uh, she talked about weed killers and talked about, um, you know, regulations, the low milk price and so on. And, you know, it, it went really well. And then towards the end, during this Q&A, a man raised his hand and he asked a question. He said, well, Miss um, Merkel, um, you know, I'm not just a farmer. I'm also a concerned citizen. And please, you know, use your powers to make sure our children have a safe future. And what was interesting, and this is, you know, I, I get back to your question now. What was interesting is he did not articulate or say what he was afraid about. He just said he was afraid about. And it's precisely this diffuse sort of fear that Merkel um, and the Social Democrats had to campaign against. And it's the same fear that the AFD is fueling. It's somehow a fear of losing something. It's a fear of, of change, of something new. And this is really sort of like what this whole uh, debate of the, uh, or the campaign of the AFD was about. Sounds a lot to uh, me like... I uh, would the like to add one small thing. I think the, the thing is that many people just felt underrepresented. They were, there is no party in the parliament who was against Merkel's policy a year ago with the refugees. So people who were concerned and, and who had fears and so on had no representation in party politics. So this is why, why some of them feel they even have to punish Ms. Merkel for all these things. In fact, um, Ulrike Herrmann, when the CDU, the Christian Democrats, Angela Merkel's party, and the, and the Social Democrats went together in their grand coalition at Federal, level, many people said, you know, we may see fringe opposition rising up outside of parliament because practically the whole political spectrum is now in the government. Is that in fact what we're seeing here, that the AFD essentially is becoming the opposition party that the parliament doesn't have? 
Well, it's of course basically a problem if you have a grand coalition and then you, we have opposition parties in the parliament like the left party or the green party. But, but they're they very are very small. small. Yeah, they yeah. are indeed very small. So, of course, there is this feeling of having an overwhelming uh, elite that somehow just rules. But um, I think that uh, Janusz is really very right when um, describing this feeling that of fear that is somehow without any concrete object. That's a fear of change. And it's true that Merkel doesn't say, well, we will never ever have any more refugees. And I think that's because she just can't promise that there won't be any more refugees because the war in Syria is going on. And um, so for her, it would be dangerous to say there will be no refugees and then they are coming. So that's something she doesn't... Well, that's I want to come I'm back saying. to the she, Chancellor, she if you don't mind. Say... Could we just... Because uh, okay. we, we have a little film about the Chancellor and I'd okay. like to okay. come back Sorry, to that yeah. just a bit okay. later. But let's perhaps stay uh, for a while with the question of the AFD supporters and who they are. If I listen to your description, Janusz Delka, it reminds me a lot of what we hear about Trump supporters in the U.S. And one of the big questions in the U.S., what, however, is the connection between between those with these vague fears and the far right, the neo-Nazi right, which mm -hmm. also, of course, exists in the U.S. What would you say is the case here in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern? The NPD, a neo-Nazi party, did used to actually have representation in parliament. It has been uh, rather strong in this state. Um, is that what we're seeing, actually, a connection? I think there is a connection, and I think it's it's important to to note this. But I think there's more. There are some observers who say that there were like around 25% of all voters who have some sort of like um, right wing tendencies who who were untapped so far, and they wouldn't vote for the NPD because they are stigmatized because they express they openly express neo-Nazi tendencies. Um, and the AFD, you know, which was founded in 2013, only three years ago, as a Eurosceptic party. Let's not forget that. It has this image of a professor's party because it was founded by economists. And this sort of like provides them with a platform to kind of like, you know, express um, not, you know, not a... I mean, they're, they're like right-wing extremists among them. But I think the far or like the large majority among AFD voters are not far-right extremists. They're far-right voters who don't feel represented by Merkel's Christian Democrats anymore. But um, they feel, yeah, sorry. Well, just a word on these two figures who were quite uh, big in uh, the state and uh, during the election campaign, Leif Erik Holm and Bjorn Höcke, look like pretty <laughs> clean-cut mainstream guys. I know you've met them. Uh, <laughs> what are they really like? Well, I, I would say uh, with, with Holm, I would agree with you. He's very much, he's a former radio host. He's very well-spoken. He's an economist by training. Um, and he is very sort of like soft-spoken, but at the same time, he leaves no doubt about his ultra-conservative stance, and particularly when it comes to family issues, when it comes to the refugees. Um, Björn Höcke, he represents the far-right wing within the AFD. And he was, I saw him at a campaign event in Schwerin, in the state capital. He was really brought in to sort of like cater to this far-right um, potential of voters within the AFD. And this is also, when you looked at the audience, there weren't that many people there, 150, 200, I would say, which is not that much for a campaign event. Um, but you could really see that there were a lot of, you know, sort of like uh, far-right um, positions among those people in the audience. And to my, I mean, my impression was, and this is very much what, what you earlier said, they, the common denominator was that they were all against something. And uh, particularly, they were all against the refugee policy. But then there were some who were against what they called gender mainstreaming. <laughs> you know, one woman said, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not okay with my kids being taught about homosexuality in school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, others are against um, Russia sanctions. You know, they want like, um, you know... It, I'm glad it's... you mentioned Russia, because here's another fascinating fact uh, that we discovered while doing the research uh, for this program. A survey by a renowned demoscopic institute shows that many supporters of the AFD trust Putin more than Merkel. What's going on there? Yeah, I think that they, what they really uh, look for is a strong leader and uh, with nationalistic ideas. And I mean, that's Putin. Putin is, Putin's program basically is Russia first. Russia has to be strong. No foreigners in Russia. Everything has to be Russian. And he's a strong leader. And that's something they really uh, find attractive. But of course, you also have to see that uh, that's East Germany. And of course, there, was, there are very strong and close ties for 40 years to Russia that still have a um, 
some... I think that explains much more. I mean, if they were just looking for strong leaders, no, they no. could even admire Erdogan from Turkey, and they don't. It's not just strong leaders. It's... No, but I think that also in West Germany, there is a strong support for Putin. Yes. Uh, it's, all, it's not only right. these East German ties to Russia. That's right. But, uh, I, mean, that's... I think it's interesting that, that percentage-wise, they not just gained many votes from, from the non-voters or from the NPD, for example, but a lot from the Linke. Uh, I think the, the left, the, the, the from, from, the, from the very left party because they are anti-globalist, anti-TTIP, anti-American, pro-Russian. So they, they even took over a lot of elements from the left-wing thinkings. So th this is a combination of, of, of populist right-wing and left-wing uh, motivations. So speaking of trust and leadership, Angela Merkel's popularity ratings, which were once seemingly unshakable, have been headed downward recently. Let's take a look. Of course, the outcome of this poll is linked with our refugee policy. I'm the party leader and I'm the chancellor. You can't divide the Jew, so I'm responsible. Still, I believe we made the right decisions. A lot of voters disagree. Merkel's lost control. She believes that everyone can just come here and do whatever they want. I believe that Angela Merkel's time is over. The latest polls indicate that the Chancellor's popularity has dipped to a five-year low. And many of her party colleagues are demanding a course correction. Has Germany lost confidence in Angela Merkel? So, Malte Leming, the Angela Merkel we saw there at the beginning of that report, she was speaking from the G20. She was visibly humble, visibly concerned. And she said, for example, she takes responsibility and she knows she has to demonstrate to people that the problems are being solved. Later in the week, she assured Parliament that Germany will remain Germany despite the influx of refugees. You say that's not enough. What do you want to hear her say? First of all, I don't want to hear her say we will not take any more refugees in because this is what Ulrike Hermann just said. It's impossible to do with the, with the Syrian war going on, with all the turmoils in, in, in Africa and so on. This is just impossible. But she has to assure her voters that scenes, like the scenes we saw a year ago from refugees in, in numbering a hundred thousands and more, in a month will not be repeated. I mean, this is not a small decision. And it is regarded as her decision that she made and she was overwhelmed by the whole situation and people just want to be assured that things like this, scenes like this, will not happen again. Not without asking, not without representation, not without asking even the parliament uh, uh, to do these kind of things. And that's what she refuses to do. Janusz Stelka, would it, do you think, really made, make a difference uh, if she were to say words like that? You saw the campaign in mecklenburg vorpommern How can politicians who resist reductionism find good arguments vis-a-vis -vis politicians who are clearly willing to tap populism and anger and fear? Hmm. Well, I think my interpretation is that this, what we're seeing right now in this sort of like Merkel losing popularity has to do with this conflict between policy on the one hand and politics on the other side. She, I think, um, and this is a lot of people within her party who I talk to um, agree with that. She's done a lot of things since last year. She's implemented a lot of new measures, um, aside, new asylum laws. She accelerated deportations. She brought down the number of refugees arriving in the country. So these things worked. Her problem are politics. Her problem is how to communicate these things. And I think one sort of like moment that kind of a lot of people felt was kind of the straw that uh, broke the camel's back was her repeating the sentence, we can do it, wir schaffen das, we will manage the situation this summer, one year later, where a lot of people said, why are you repeating this? I mean, it might even, that's what, you know, her party fellows tell me, you know, when we talk on background, they're like, well, you know, this might even be accurate, this might be true, this might be, you know, the reality, but why are you saying that? People misunderstand these things. People misunderstand statements like this as if she wasn't listening to their concerns. And I think this is exactly the sort of um, fear that the AFD is capitalizing but on. Isn't that unfair? We say these voters want a strong leader. When she then utters a sentence that's meant to encourage, 
to build confidence. Everybody's uh, honor for for saying yeah. words yeah, like that. Exactly, and that's, this is why I said, you know, this is uh, above all a communication failure. Actually, I, I talked to a bunch of linguists about this <laughs> sentence, and what they said is, you know, it's in terms of like political communication, it's so unfortunate because it has an unclear reference in it. It says we can do it. So what's it? And of course, it's being um, misappropriated. It's being misused by her opponents with saying like, oh, we can do it. We can take in everyone, you know, who wants to come. No, this is I not think, what she means. I think the problem is completely different. The problem is uh, uh, she did everything there was to do. And that's something you agree. And then she has her own party always saying, well, it's not enough, uh, we are failing. Uh, and I mean, that's especially the CSU, that's the Bavarian party uh, or the Bavarian branch of the Conservative Party. And they uh, con uh, continuously claim that nothing's being done, despite the fact that everything's being done. And now, what is the population to be uh, supposed to, do, uh, to believe if those who are in rule or those uh, uh, governing always claim that they, uh, they themselves don't govern? Exactly. And, and so that's yeah. about that party. That party, if I can just uh, weave in a quote from it right here, the Bavarian CSU's leader, Horst Seehofer, yeah, exactly, himself yeah. quite a populist figure, mm -hmm. said this week that, quote, folks don't want the politics that Berlin is serving up. Well, he yeah. He, his party, is, is part of the government. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It is, but and that's you know, a problem. Yeah, and you can't, and that's nothing you can do. Uh, that's something you can't overcome, or that's stronger than the chancellor. No, but it, you have to understand, as the chancellor, there are two interpretations of the sentence. The one is, I mean, outside Germany, nobody will understand that we are discussing a phrase like "we can do it." It's, it's just encouraging. <laughs> it, it gives you optimism. Things. What's Barack so strong? Obama got a lot yeah. of but, love. Yeah, for yeah, a lot of exactly. love. But, but the second interpretation, "we can do it," is like, oh, that's not a deal. We can do it. I mean, it's just. De diminishing the size of the problem. And she shows that you, she's not understanding how big the problem is. Ah, oh, we can do it. That okay. sounds completely different to, yes, I think we can do it. Let's just get away from the semantics, though, for a moment and talk about the other parties uh, and their contribution to the difficulties that, that the Chancellor is in. You said earlier, perhaps it's not fair to blame her. And the fact is, both of her coalition party, parties, not only the junior sister party in Bavaria, but the, the Social Democrats are acting like they aren't part of the government. We've heard the Social Democrats also doing quite a bit of Merkel bashing this week. Yes, I mean, they, they, they try now a, a, a kind of new narrative. They, they're saying, yes, we supported her decision a year ago, opening the borders, letting the refugees in. But then she made tremendous failures in recognizing how huge the problem is, integration, and all these things. And that's, that's what went wrong. So that, that is, is she's, they're trying to have it both ways, to be on her side with her decision a year ago, but to distance from her in implementing all these refugee policies. And, and lest we forget to get back to like policy and politics, we are entering a campaign mode in this country. Yeah. There are like national elections coming up next year. And with the CSU, the Christian Social Union, Merkel's Bavarian sister party, it's important to note that throughout 60 years of their party history, the most important thing to them is to um, to hold up their hegemonial power in Bavaria, which is the only state where they and exist. They're doing a good thing. Yeah, yes. yeah. They the are AFD still is down in, at almost fifty percent, and the AfD is yeah. at seven percent. But yeah. I think the problem really is, I mean, uh, that everyone thinks that one million refugees must be a big, a big problem. That's something that you also say. She should acknowledge that it is a big problem. It is not a big problem. You can see that we have taken in one million uh, refugees, and nonetheless. The budget is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, has a surplus. So, you know, in fact, to be honest, we could have taken two million refugees and the uh, budget would still be in a surplus. So it's, it, it's kind of weird that everyone in Germany thinks that it's a big problem to have refugees, despite the fact that, they c that we can finance them without even raising the taxes or going into debt. I, I, so don't, think the, I don't think the problem is, or what, what causes all the tension is, is, is financially. I think what caused it is there are just a million people from, from, from the Orient, from Syria, Iraq, Eritrea, from places, Afghanistan, from places like this, and they just are, are strangers in, in a country like Germany. This is the kind of fear. This is the diver diversity fear problems. that you yeah. talked yeah. about earlier. Before we run out of time, I would like to ask you, because of course you mentioned the federal election, our title asks how isolated is Merkel? I'd like to ask all of you very briefly how you see the implications for the next election and for Merkel's own political fate? Could it be that she will not be standing for her party? Ulrike Herrmann, we'll just go quickly uh, around. Uh, she will run because there is no one else in the CDU who could become chancellor. They don't have other candidates. 
Janusz Stelke? I'm pretty sure she will run for chancellor, but I also thought it would be impossible for the UK to vote to leave the EU, and they did. So in politics, <laughs> everything is possible. And the fate of the AFD? Well, the AFD is here to stay. Yeah. I would agree the AFD is here to stay, but Merkel has to do a lot better job explaining not just her politics or policy, but where the, where the, where the, where the borders of humanity lie. And what do you think? Is this Kanzler Demmerung the beginning of the end for Merkel? No, will she no. see... Uh... Not, not now. She, will, she is diminished in power and influence, but, but she's still a very, very strong figure in European and German politics. Okay, that sounded like a consensus. Many thanks to all of you for being with us today and many thanks to all of you for tuning in. See you soon.